Oh, hello there, Professor Flint here, and I'm here uh, for Dinosaur University, of course, but I'm here in the Flinders University Paleo Lab, and I'm here with my good friend, Kerry. Hello, Kerry. G'day, Professor Flint. And G'day, the internet. Hello there. Um, and so we are here, um, there, are, there are hundreds of different uh, fossils that you've got here uh, in the lab. Um, and and your, your role, you're a, a preparator, is that right? A I am technician? a preparator. So a preparator is somebody who works with fossils, but not necessarily have to be a scientist. My job is to actually clean these fossils and to prepare them ready for study, thus the name preparator. So I glue bones back together that are broken. I take all the dirt and the rock away from bones so that they can be seen. Uh, I basically get to clean them up and toughen them up so that scientists can measure them, describe them, do all the things that scientists need to do to them. Of course. So, But it's called the Dirty Lab, isn't it? This is called the Dirty Lab. Because it's quite dirty at times. Quite dirty. We uh, make a lot of dust, we make a lot of dirt, we make a lot of mud. All sorts of things go on in this lab. Uh, things that we don't necessarily want in our nice, clean collections. But without the work that people like you do, then we wouldn't see a fossil like this uh, in, in the glorious way that we do. Um, and so the, the scientists, the paleontologists, will then come and have a look at something like this and go, well, what is it? How do I know what it is? And if we can... I reckon if we move it a little bit closer... We can shift this up close. We can shift it close because... Part of our job as, as paleontologists is when we look at something like this, we... Teeth. We like teeth, don't we? We love teeth. Paleontologists, well, particularly vertebrate paleontologists who study animals with teeth, we love teeth. <laughs> and we love teeth because teeth tell us lots of things about animals. They tell us about uh, animals that are related to each other because animals that are related to each other have similar types of teeth. But they also tell us things about diets and the kinds of food that animals eat. At a, at a macro level, at a big level, we can look at teeth like this and what shape are they, Kelly? Well, these teeth you can see are actually quite square and flat. So animals that eat meat quite often have very sharp teeth. Animals that eat plants have very flat, crushing teeth. So we begin on the assumption that this is an animal that would have eaten Plants. Eaten plants. We can even, um, in some fossilised teeth of this animal and, uh, and other animals, we can actually even look at a microscopic level and see scratch marks on teeth. Exactly, yeah. That, the micro that help tell us specific plants that it might have eaten. But this particular fossil here has also got these two forward-facing teeth here. So these two big teeth at the front, they might look pointy and sharp, but they're actually rounded on the end and this is the flat surface on the top. So even though they look like big, sharp, pointy tusks, these are also for eating plants. They're not sharp teeth at all. Okay, and, and it's those teeth, in fact, from which it got its name, isn't it? It is, yes. So uh, there's two of them. Yes. Uh, the word for two is die. Die. They're forward-facing or front teeth. The word for forward-facing or front is, is proto. proto. And they're teeth. What's the word? What's the Latin word for teeth? You would be looking for don. Don. So that's diprotodon. Diprotodon. Uh, this is the skull of diprotodon. Now, how big is this skull, Kerry? This skull, uh, I think this is, well, this is well over half a metre long. Um, the jaw, the skull obviously is a bit longer towards Professor Flint. So when this animal was alive, its skull would easily have been a metre long. Because you have to put, remember, you've got to put the muscle on it, the, the fur, all of that stuff. So it all of a sudden, instead of just being that, it kind of reaches up. And, the, and this is just, remember, this is just this bit here. That bit there, the bottom part of the jaw. So it's, uh, it's a herbivore. Uh, it, uh, we know that they came from Australia. Yes, Australia is the only country in the world you can find diprotodon. It's a very Australian animal. And we find them all over Australia. And, of course, the uniqueness of a lot of Australian mammals is that they are marsupials, which means... Uh, marsupials are mammals that keep their babies in a pouch. So this animal, as big as a rhinoceros, would have had a pouch. Would have had a pouch to keep its little babies in. OK, so speaking of the babies, now how big would have the babies been? Well, when marsupials are born, 
they are very, very tiny. So a baby kangaroo, for example, would be about the size of a baked bean when it's born. Then it's got to crawl up into the pouch where it begins to actually grow. So we can assume the same sort of thing for diprotodon. When it was born, it may have been a very tiny little thing. Uh, but then in the pouch, it would have grown, got bigger and bigger and bigger, until it got to a point where it didn't fit in the pouch anymore and had to get out and walk on its own. Now, the other thing we've got here is um, a pretty cool looking skeleton. Except it's not an actual skeleton, is it? No, this isn't an actual skeleton. This is a little wooden model that we've made. Um, let's just put this behind. Let's have a look. Oh, yeah, we see can see. See if we can spot him. There we go. So, the good thing about Diprotodon is it's a pretty common fossil around Australia. So, we do know what all of the parts of Diprotodon look like. So, we know what shape it was. We know how tall it was. We know that it walked on four legs. Uh, we know the kinds of food that it ate from the teeth. Uh, yeah, we know where it lived around the country because we find the fossils there. So we can build pretty accurate skeletons of this animal. Yeah, and because we don't have one that is complete, do we? No, I don't think there is a 100% every single little piece of a skeleton found. But, but imagine, imagine if you've got a jigsaw puzzle... I've got a jigsaw puzzle and I've got the leg piece missing. Yep. You've got a jigsaw puzzle of Diprotodon. But maybe I've only got the leg and I'm missing everything else. Or you've got <laughs> another piece missing. Yep. And then we can compare our jigsaw puzzles and go, well, that's what that bit is and that's what that bit is. That's exactly right. And that's right. how we know what the entire skeleton of a Diprotodon looks like. And that works often with lots of fossils too. And that's why yes. it's really important for paleontologists to share information and, and talk to each other and stuff, which That's is what right. we do. So, okay, so you have this, but we see with paleo artists working with paleontologists, we, we see illustrations, whether it's of dinosaurs or other prehistoric animals. Now, we haven't actually seen that animal alive. No. So how do we know what they look like? Well, this is fascinating because we have all of this information. So we know the size and shape of an animal. But what we're missing is all of the soft parts of the animal. So we don't know what colour Diprotodon was. We don't know if it was a stripy animal or a spotty animal or if it had really long shaggy hair or anything like that. Uh, Diprotodon, even though it's really common, is still a bit of a mystery. Uh, we can have reconstructions. So I've got this wonderful little model here that's been made of a diprotodon and i've got this little fluffy <laughs> toy made of a diprotodon so the now they're a different color aren't they they're a different color uh the great thing about this is is nobody can tell you which one is right and which one is wrong or if one's right at all perhaps diprotodon was black perhaps it was white perhaps it was spotty we don't really know but it's fascinating to have a go at recreating these animals and trying to get an idea of what they might have looked like. Because if you look at animals around the world today, there's an almost infinite variety of colours and stripes and spots and textures uh, of all different types of animals. But so of course the important thing to remember is that animals in the past would have used colour in the same way that animals do now. That's exactly so right. what, are some, what are factors that matter for an animal in terms of colours? Camouflage is one. Exactly. So I wouldn't expect Diprotodon to be bright pink. Uh, maybe it was, there are pink animals today, but it doesn't make sense for a diprotodon because it would stand out in the desert and if there were any predators or something, it'd be, too were, easy to it find. would be too easy to find. Um, other animals, so camouflage, yes, absolutely. Yep. So, But display is one thing, camouflage is another. So those two things in particular, um, we see with different animals, whether it's birds or reptiles or... Yep. Uh, well, mammals give us a, a sense of, of, of colours and Different things. animals may have different colours depending on if they're male or female. Uh, of course. Different markings on each animal to identify an individual. So a wonderful thing about uh, zebra is that their stripes are like fingerprints. Each individual zebra has its own pattern of stripes. And it turns out there's been some research, recent research, that suggests that that patterning... Um, because people have often thought that it's to do with, you know, you confuse a lion because they're, they're looking at all these stripes. But one of the things is that it keeps the flies away. Yeah, there's all sorts of reasons <laughs> you can be various colours and patterns and shapes. So 
So if I had stripes, maybe Australians should be striped we should be if we're going into the mm. outback to keep the flies away. Good. So it's not just colour. Uh, it's also texture. We don't know if the fur was really, really long and shaggy or if it was woolly like a sheep or something like that. What about these things here? What about the ears? The ears. Also, uh, we never find the ears from fossil animals because the ears are floppy. So your ears, like Professor mine. Flint. Now, there's something I in there, isn't floppy there? floppy ears. <laughs> <laughs> there's something in there, but they can bend. So bone, you'll find, doesn't bend. Bone breaks, but your ears can bend, but then they go back into shape. So the stuff inside ears is called cartilage. Which, which is what shark skeletons are made which of. Which is what shark skeletons are made of. Now, cartilage doesn't have the same mineral content of bone. It doesn't fossilise as readily. So it's possible to get a cartilage fossil, but it's very, very rare very and rare. highly unlikely for this sort of animal. And, and the interesting thing, of course, is in, in terms of reconstructing animals, and one of my favourite examples is always, if you didn't know what a koala looked like and you saw a koala skull... There's no way you'd put the teddy bear face on a koala. You wouldn't put the little teddy bear face on it. I mean, you might. I don't know, but, but, but it, it, it shows you the, the, the difficulty... Um, but also the, the why it's fascinating, and you said before, we, we have these two different versions. They're, you know, based on the same kind of skeleton. Yep. So science has a lot of fact, but there's also room for a lot of imagination still. Absolutely. Okay, just a few more things. What else have we got here, Kerry? Well, we've got a couple of other things. Um, I do like this one. Oh. This is another example of the size of diprotodons. So... This fossil I've got here, thank you Professor Flint, uh, this is one of the vertebrae uh, from a diprotodon. So this is from a fully grown adult, uh, and this is one of the vertebrae from its neck. Just to give you an idea, so the diprotodon's neck, the muscle and the fur must have been all the way around this. So this has got a huge thick neck to hold up this great big head. So the same bone on a human would almost fit through this hole on the inside of this diprotodon. So I can put my neck bone through there. You certainly could. I won't. We'd have to take I'm your head off. Using it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that that again. It's so 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 the, the 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 size of the babies, the size of our own neck vertebrae gives you a sense of of that. Now, how many vertebrae would they have had in their neck? Well, this is the great thing about uh, mammals in particular is that most of them have exactly the same number of bones. So Which is seven? Seven in the neck, uh, 14 have ribs, seven lumbars, which are below the ribs, and then any number in the tail, wait depending a minute. what wait, sort wait, of animal wait, you wait, are. Wait a minute, so seven. So I've got seven. Yep, I've got seven. A giraffe. Giraffe has, has seven. Has seven. So same number, but obviously... Different shape. Different so, shape. Diprotodon and... has a very thin neck vertebrae. A giraffe has the same number, but its vertebrae are quite long in this direction, quite deep. And that's where the giraffe gets its long neck from. So if you look at a giraffe, it only has seven pieces in that neck. But they're huge. Now you said most mammals. There are some exceptions. The one thing you learn about it's nature and biology, weird. every time you make a rule, something comes along and breaks it. So animals like uh, dugongs and sloths can have different numbers of neck vertebrae. Now, do they have similar numbers to each other, or do they have... No, I think one might have five, another one has nine. We don't really know. I mean, it's not something I'm an expert in. Maybe somebody out there knows... That's something the you answer. can find out. That's your job. That's find it. out how many neck bones in sloths and in dugongs. dugongs yeah. and, but also look at, start looking at other animals too, because long neck dinosaurs... Yes. Um, reptiles break reptiles, the rule. Remember, it's only mammals that have those yes. numbers. Birds have different numbers of vertebrae in their necks. Fish course, have different numbers. Different numbers, different shapes, and those different shapes and numbers allow different things. Plesiosaurs, you know, we we used to think that they would have their necks like that, but it's like, actually, you know, they're probably... That's right, the shape more of the vertebrae. Like that, the shape of the yes. vertebrae tells us what it does. Okay, um, we are fast running out of time. Um... Uh, anything else you want to tell us about what we know about diprotodons? I mean, they lived all around Australia. Very we Australian. We think because of some marks on their teeth they found in Queensland that uh, our colleague uh, Dr Gilbert has worked on, um, that maybe they, they migrated a bit. Obviously, they, more research needed there. More research needed to be done. Um, one of my favourite things about diprotodon is 
to imagine Australia with these giant animals walking around all over the place. So we can go to places like Africa today and you can see large animals. You can see the rhinos, the hippos, the elephants. Australia wasn't that different. We had lots and lots of giant animals. Which is so, why we use the term megafauna, megafauna. because that means big animals. So if you were here, say, 40,000 years ago, you could have gone on safari and seen giant animals walking around the plains of Australia. Uh, it's a very different place to what it is today. And I guess the other thing to remember is because we know the protodons were all over the place. And like here in Adelaide, for example, we find them at Hallett Cove. They definitely existed on the Adelaide yeah, Plains. On the Adelaide Plains, we find them up at Butter. Yes. So wherever you are in Adelaide, you may have had the protodons strolling. But of course, other prehistoric um, uh, marsupials and megafauna as well. Oh, plenty but, of them. And the important thing to remember, living alongside the koalas and the reds and the grey kangaroos right. and the possums and stuff. So it's not that those animals shrunk. That's it's right. It's that yes. these animals disappeared. Yes, that's right. So I this, mean, they didn't just get on a plane and go. This <laughs> didn't turn into a smaller animal. No. The smaller animal was here the whole time. This one disappeared. This it's one, very important th these, to know. These ones yeah. went extinct. And on that note, we're going to leave it for now because that is an entirely other question that we will explore a whole different story. another time. So thank you all for listening. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching. If you've got any questions, post them in the comments below. Ask and questions. Um, That's how we get science done. Absolutely. Thank you, Kerry. We thank will you very see you much, again Professor soon. Flint. Thank you, the internet. Cheerio. See ya.